Coming up on 2020 on ID, a Las Vegas mother of four out for a drive at night. The car came up really fast behind us. He swerves around us and I honked the horn. That mother supposedly followed home, gunned down. I was screaming and crying, saying mom's been shot, mom's been shot. The hunt for her attacker is on. Her family destroyed by grief. Got the fight right. But was the first story in the headlines... The parent incident of road rage. The entire story? Wait, what happened? A lot more complicated than the first reports of road rage. What really happened that night? We put all the pieces together. Witnesses telling what you've never heard before. And the first words out of his mouth, I got them. The victim painted as a villain. People start to wonder, should I be feeling bad for her? Are you all happy? You made my wife look like an animal. And the suspect with his own story to tell. Every direction I went, she would just follow me. In this story, nothing is as it appears to be. And whatever happened in Vegas, doesn't stay in Vegas. If this were a movie, it would almost be too unrealistic. A dangerous intersection. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It's a tale that seemed all too familiar. A heated exchange between two strangers leads to road rage and then murder. But in the story you're about to see, as the truth unfolds, it reveals a knot of tangled relationships, mistaken identity, and overwhelming fear. As Deborah Roberts first reported in 2015, no one could have seen this chance encounter going so terribly wrong. It's a cool Thursday night in America's favorite adult playground, Las Vegas, and the strip is already jumping. But across town near another playground in a part of Vegas where people actually live, a local mom's about to set a mystery in gear. She pulls in and she smiles and she's like, I don't need you crashing the car. 44-year-old Tammy Myers is giving her 15-year-old daughter Crystal her first driving lesson. At 10 o'clock at night? Why would you go for a driving lesson at night? I wanted to go at night because, I mean, there's no cars around that you can possibly hit. And why'd you pick that area? Oh, it's close to home. So Tammy steers her 1993 Buick from the family home on Mount Shasta Circle to this empty parking lot at a nearby junior high school. A parking lot that's just wide open. Tammy and husband Bob have raised four kids in this neighborhood, teaching them all to drive right here. So you didn't think anything about the fact that they were going driving late at night? You know, we live in Las Vegas. We're a 24-hour town. That night, Bob is 300 miles away on business in Kernville, California, a traveling vendor selling hats and T-shirts at local fairs and sporting events. Son Robert Jr. is with him, the others back in Vegas, the eldest, Brandon, at home. And everything was good. Everybody was happy. And... Here's how Crystal says it all played out. Back in that parking lot, she takes the wheel, delicately maneuvering the car, delighting in every turn. I was just like, OK, I'm getting the hang of this. Then the lesson moves from the parking lot to the neighborhood's main streets. We finally stopped, and she pulled over, and we switched seats. Tammy now takes the wheel. Crystal says her mom is teaching her how to change lanes. She's going at a snail's pace when suddenly an impatient driver appears in the rear view. There was a silver car. I just noticed that he was riding, like riding our bumper. And then he swerves around us and I honked the horn. That honk of the horn, something we've all done, would change everything. So then you pull up here. She turns right and right about here. When Crystal says that silver car suddenly sideswipes them. And we had to stop really hard. Who is this guy? Do you know? No, I didn't recognize him. Were you scared? Yeah, I was. I was really scared. And uh, he gets out the car. It's OK. Take your time. And he says, I'm going to kill you and your daughter. He says, I'm going to kill you and your daughter? Yeah. In a panic, Crystal says they flee the scene. But what happens next is a puzzle we piece together. Everyone agrees that sometime after 11 o'clock, two cars barrel down Mount Shasta Circle to the end of the cul-de-sac where the Myers live. That old Buick driven by Tammy and a four-door silver sedan driven by a mystery man in hot pursuit with a gun. You heard the shots? Yeah, I was looking and I 
heard the shots. Did you know she had been hit? Yeah, I was screaming. He said, mom's been shot, mom's been shot. Brandon, her eldest son, remembers running to his mother's side as that silver sedan flees the scene. I was just screaming at her, mom, please stay here, stay here. Brandon was telling her to stay awake. And she was closing her eyes. She's hit in the head. A frantic Brandon dials 911, and at 11.34, Tammy's rushed to a nearby hospital. At the scene of the shooting, leads and evidence are scarce. Did you have any idea who had shot your mom? No, I was completely in the blank. All I saw was the gunfire. Back in California, Bob Myers gets fragments of the story over the phone from a distraught Crystal. She said, Dad, I saw it. There was blood everywhere, all over Mom's head and face. He drops everything and begins driving home. And what's happening in your chest at this moment? I'm like, what's going on here? How fast are you driving? 100 miles an hour. Every thought saturated with concern for his wife of 25 years, the family matriarch who'd earned the name Mama Bear. What kind of a force was she in the family? She was the backbone of the family. She was everything in the family, the business, the kids, me. You know, she uh, was the godmother of all, you know, in our home. She was the prankster, the jokester, a loving wife and a good mom. Didn't have a mean bone in her body. It's not until the early morning hours of February 13th when Bob, still on the road, gets a call from police. He says, uh, Mr. Myers, it started off as a road rage. They followed your wife home and shot your wife. Frantic, he wants to know more and begins calling TV stations, asking for updates, and granting interviews. I'm speechless. I, I've, I've been with this woman 25 years. He is now the vocal spokesperson for the Myers family. Local reporter Jackie Heinrich found it peculiar. He called our station when he was driving back from California and says, hey, I'm angry about this. How could someone do this? I didn't want to freeze out the media, and here's why I didn't. You can't find killers without the media's help. By daybreak, Bob finally arrives at the hospital and sees his wife's lifeless body. I get to the room, I see my wife. And the sight. All right, I said, I'm here, baby. And I said, oh, this is gonna be okay, you know? But his optimism is quickly dashed. The main doctor says, sir, I hate to be the one to give you this bad news, but your wife's not gonna make it. And I told my wife, no matter what it takes, I'll find out who did this to you. Later that morning... I'm right here. You know what you did last night? You come here. An angry Bob Myers stands before the cameras saying there were as many as three killers in that silver car. Three guys wanted to plow into a mother of four and come back and shoot her, follow her home and kill her. By the end of the day's news cycle, here's the official narrative. Police say three suspects in a small silver car nearly collided with her green Buick. It followed them home, someone inside opening fire. As the Buick becomes a makeshift memorial, Tammy Myers appears to be yet another victim in an endless string of road rage incidents. Los Angeles, Tampa, Randleman, North Carolina. And this scene in Austin, Texas. Two men in the middle of traffic going at it with a baseball bat and a wooden pole. But this one is unlike any other. A mom cut down in her own driveway. Road rage mystery in Las Vegas. The mother shot after teaching her daughter how to drive. But despite all the attention, no arrests. The next day, February 14th, a heartbreaking Valentine's Day. Vegas police released this security video of the silver sedan cruising the neighborhood around the time of the shooting. And with it, this composite sketch. Police say this is the face of one of the suspects. Police say it's Crystal's description of one of the strangers in the car that sideswiped her and her mom, threatening to kill them. He's a big guy, six feet tall, weighing about 180 pounds. As far as we can tell, there was no prior contact with these individuals. They are complete strangers. There's a manhunt for this unknown guy. Instilling fear in everyone across the valley, everyone's like, could this happen to me? Neighbors are too afraid to show their faces with that suspect still out there. That night, an agonizing moment for Bob Myers. At 7.05, he disconnects his beloved wife from an artificial respirator. I always have a wife, she'll never leave my heart. But she's gone. I didn't want my baby to suffer. But I didn't want her to go either. You know, to 
I have to say it's okay to turn off the switch to let your wife go. So you had to do it. Had to. But before Tammy Myers can have a funeral, she's about to be buried. It's like they were murdering her all over again, repeatedly, daily. Tammy Myers went looking for the driver. Are you happy? As the story takes the first of what will be many sharp turns, was the innocent victim really all that innocent? Maybe this isn't what I thought it was in the beginning. And a young woman with inside knowledge about that night. But to break the case, she must find the courage to turn in a friend. You called the police. What did you say? Everything. Stay with us. After a chance encounter with an angry driver, mother of four, Tammy Myers, has been shot dead outside her home. It seems like a case of road rage gone terribly wrong. But as Deborah Roberts reports, a piece of new information is about to turn this story on its head. The mother targeted. The hunt for her attacker is on in what's being called a case of road rage. She was a good woman and she didn't deserve this. While police search for the person who gunned down Tammy Myers, her family comes to grips with their loss. Three days after removing his wife from life support... Dear God, protect them in the days to come. Bob Myers holds a candlelight vigil. This is a testament to a good person in a community that needs good people. But now there are as many whispers about shooting victim Tammy Myers as there are prayers for her. I want to keep the facts as they are because it's starting to get twisted. Just hours earlier, police announced a stunning discovery, one that paints a much different picture of this Las Vegas mom. The reason uh, I wanted everyone here was to just clarify some things. A big piece of the Myers account has been missing. Turns out between that alleged road rage incident and the shootout, Tammy Myers returned home with no one in pursuit, dropped off her daughter, and instead of dialing 911, picked up her son, who's armed with a gun, and went back on the road. She tells her 15-year-old daughter to wake up her son, who was in bed, and have him come outside and get in the car with her so that they can find who frightened them while they were on the roadway. She got her 22-year-old son to get his weapon. I mean, people start to wonder, should I be feeling bad for her? Local reporter Jackie Heinrich says that surprising and late disclosure changed the whole tone of the story. When the police held a press conference and said, actually, Tammy Myers went back out, then they started to think, maybe this isn't what I thought it was in the beginning. Suddenly, the family is feeling the burn of online hate with comments like, am I the only one who's glad she got shot? It was a firestorm of people just upset with what they had been told and what they'd been led to believe by the Myers family. On social media, people began to really turn on oh, yeah. your wife and your son. Well, it bothered me. All of them did because my wife wasn't a troublemaker. Bob is suddenly doing damage control, insisting that this is not a vigil for a vigilante. My son is not an animal. My son is a hero in my book. So what's Brandon's story? He says his mother was convinced that Road Rager was headed to the house to make good on his death threat. She said, someone's trying to kill us, we need to go now. I'm like, why don't we call 911? You said, let's call 911. Yeah, and she goes, we need to get away from the house. They're trying to hurt us. How scared was she? How was she reacting? Like, it was just something I've never seen before. She goes, we need to go now, get in the car, or I'm leaving without you. Did you go back for your gun? No, I, before I left out the door, I grabbed it. Brenda's gun, a registered Beretta 9mm pistol. Why'd you grab the gun? Just safety precautions. Someone's trying to hurt my family, so I'm going to come protect them. Brandon claims that, you know, he only went with his mom because she asked him to, and he tried to hold her back and restrain her. But in the end, he got his gun, he got in the car, and he went out looking for these people. Brandon takes me on a drive to relive that night with his frightened mom behind the wheel. Like she just like held her mouth was open. She was she was terrified. He points out the spot where he says his mom and sister were sideswiped by that angry driver. I've been right here. Right here. Do you see any cars? No, nothing. So he says they call it a night and head home. Still no cars, nobody's coming near you. No one's near us. Completely it's a ghost town. But then, just as they make a right turn by the junior high school, he says they spot a silver car. So they were right here in front of us. 
She saw the silver car right here. It was literally right here in front of us. Things would escalate, leading to the shootout in the cul-de-sac, with both Brandon and that mystery shooter exchanging more than 20 rounds. But the exact how and who of the incident still puzzles police. That is, until this woman picks up a phone and drops a dime. You called the police. I felt that I had to. Were you conflicted? Absolutely. I still am even sitting here. Nearly a week after the shootout, investigators interview this woman, Caitlin Christian. For the first time, she's sharing her story about the night Tammy died. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning, I was sleeping. My phone was going off the wall. She says it's 19-year-old Eric Nausch, a wannabe rapper and pot dealer seen here in his Instagram photos. Caitlin says he's a close friend with whom she shared everything. You just connect with certain people, and, and Eric and I had a connection. He had lost his father as he was a kid. I lost my mom when I was a kid, so instantly that just connects people. And so he had that, that loyalty that I have as well, and so we just became good friends. And that loyalty's about to be tested. It was, I need to come over, something important. How did he sound? Um, disheveled, you know, shook it up. Caitlin says now she comes over to her apartment, confessing to a shooting in his neighborhood. And the first words out of his mouth is, I got them. Telling her he may have shot a rival drug dealer. And then he showed you something. Mm -hmm. What did he show you? Well, he had emptied his backpack. Um, he had pulled out his gun and extra clips for the gun. Nausch leaves. Then, days later, it hits Caitlin. Her friend may have been involved in Tammy Meyer's shooting. You read the details that there's a mom of four who shot and killed. What goes through you at that moment? How could this happen? And I didn't even finish the article before I got up and called. Called? The police. She makes a wrenching decision to turn in her trusting friend. And how did you feel after the conversation once you told them what you knew? Terrible, but there's always a right and a wrong. The next day, SWAT team squad cars surround Eric Nausch's home. He's holed up inside. Our Las Vegas affiliate, KTNV, is live on the scene. Right now, we are in the tactical phase of attempting to take a suspect into custody. Caitlin says she's texting Eric nonstop. So you were trying to convince him to surrender. Right. Still a very confusing scene out here as everybody is arriving here on scene. One of those arriving is the suspect's mother, who's in obvious distress. Guys, please, you guys, get back. Please! Turn your phone off! But as the standoff drags into its second hour, questions in this already complex case are multiplying. For one thing, Eric doesn't even drive, and he bears little resemblance to Crystal Meyer's description of the shooter. I mean, he's really small. He's nowhere near six foot. And just as bizarre, the location of his house, just a block away from the Meyer's residence on Mount Shasta Circle. We go through the play-by-play -play on this map with ABC legal analyst Dan Abrams. The irony being that the suspect is right around the corner from this family. They're out looking for some composite sketch of some guy in a road rage incident. And little do they know that it's a block away. You can literally see his home from my front door. And you walked over to his home really angry. Pajamas and all. Not the fight, white. You were yelling. Oh, I was upset. No, it ain't okay. Bob Myers is devastated. The police stopping him from getting any closer. And in that moment, his understandable grief turns to unforgiving anger. Are you all happy? You made my wife look like an animal or my son. There's the animal a block away. Are you happy? My wife was a victim. She lost her life. And it's like they were murdering her all over again, repeatedly, daily. Finally, a shirtless Nausch surrenders. Suspect has been taken into custody. Suspect is en route to headquarters uh, to be interviewed. Yes, police have questions, but nobody's prepared for the shocking answers. The story's not right. My name's getting thrown in. Nausch is about to spin a whole new version of the story. When we come back, Eric Nausch says road rage had nothing to do with it. I just had a threat on my phone and claims Tammy Myers was stalking him. Every direction I went, she was just following. Everywhere I went, that car was there. Stay with us.
One week after the murder of Tammy Myers, there is an arrest in the case. But as police bring the suspect in for questioning, the twists and turns continue. Once again, here's Deborah Roberts. Teenager in custody. His name is Eric Nosh. We know the suspect is here at Metro headquarters. While the media churns the news of Eric Nosh's arrest, the 19-year-old suspect himself is alone with his thoughts, slumped across an interrogation table, while others are thinking, just who is this kid? His Instagram account is full of photos of what appear to be drugs. By all accounts, Nausch is a wannabe gangster rapper and low-level drug dealer known on the streets as Baby G, the kind of guy who ends up either famous or in jail, or in this case, both. You got your water? It's all good? Mm -hmm. All right. But his close friend, Caitlin Christian, sees him more as a lost child, whose father committed suicide in 2010 and is now living with his mother and a baby sister. Eric is a good person. Eric has a huge heart. Was he a troubled kid? I don't believe so. He wasn't a violent person. I believe that there's a void when a parent's not there, but I don't think he was a troubled individual, no. Now she may be in need of a father figure, and Detective Clifford Mogg is happy to oblige, kicking off the interview with a laid-back Miranda warning. I just need to advise you of your rights, and then I want to talk about you. All right, you have the right to remain silent. You After some that? friendly talk... So, tell me about Eric. The cuffs are off, trust building. You'll be cool with us, aren't you? And very slowly, Detective Mogg starts pulling the string. In your mind, what's this all about? Tell me. Well, you guys think that I did something? Now says he's no killer, just a pothead who likes to light up at Anson Park. Curiously, the park just across the street from the junior high school where Tammy Myers was giving that driving lesson. The park has always been my number one spot. But now she says on the night of Tammy's murder, he was hanging out at this guy's house. Yeah. Murder, 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 kill, kill, kill. A local rapper named Young Crane. I went over there sometime between the afternoon and I was there until the next morning. Then talk of weapons. Have you ever been in possession of any handguns, real guns? Um, yeah, when? but I got rid of it. When? Um, probably about like a month ago. So describe the gun. It was like this big. Mm-hmm. And it was black. And the Much needed protection now says because rival drug dealers had been threatening him and his family. Kids threaten your family or other people threaten your family? Yes. An hour later, detectives finally reveal their hand, letting Nausch know they've already blown up his alibi because his best friend, Caitlin, has told them everything. Katie really likes you. She said you were like a little brother to her. Where he'd been, what he'd done, and the gun he did it with. I knew about that gun that you were talking about way before you ever told me. This is crazy. Dude. It is. Everybody's trying to see you do the right thing, but everybody realizes that you made a bad mistake that night, okay? And the fact that you sought out Katie to talk to that night, that lets me know that this was really bothering you. Cornered, Nausch can no longer carry the weight on his slender shoulders. Come here, Eric. Look, Look son. Tell me what happened, okay? You gotta get this off your mind. I mean, it's no more, no more, no So tell me what happened. Tell me from the beginning, Eric. Now get ready for Nausha's story, which begins just after 10 o'clock. That night, he's in the park, armed and paranoid over the threats he'd been receiving when he notices Tammy's Buick circling slowly in the school parking lot. Every direction I went, she would just follow me. Everywhere I went, that car was there. He says he was sure it was someone stalking him, so he hides and calls a friend to pick him up so he can get away. It was a smooth 30, 45 minutes before I even got in the car until I knew his car was out of sight. The friend arrives in a silver Audi sedan. Now she thinks he's escaped his enemies, but almost instantly crosses paths with that Buick once again. They just came out of nowhere. They were following us, I didn't even turn. He tells police something that surprises them, that someone in the other car was brandishing a gun at him. So far we have you telling us that these people were waving a gun. In fact, waving a gun yeah. out the window. Listen to me. No money but you have said that. And he reveals something else that thus far has gone unreported. He fires shots at Tammy's car even before the fatal shooting. And I just caught you back and I started shooting them. 
He says the cars separate and he starts heading home. But as he turns onto his street, suddenly they are once again face to face. And go back and they're passing my house, dude. With their arms out and everything, they're passing my house. And now she now panicking, follows that car into the cul-de-sac. I really thought these were the guys that were they've been threatening me this whole time. When you pulled into the cul-de-sac, what did you see? First thing I see running up to the door. That's no. all I kept thinking is they going to grab more straps and I don't let up a bullet I had in there. I got scared. Do you think he had any idea that it was Tammy Myers in that car? No. I, I full-heartedly, in my soul, believe he had no idea. You know, you can tell when someone's hiding facts or, or holding back, and he wasn't. He didn't even know if anyone had been struck at this point, let alone who was in the vehicle. He had no idea. After unloading his gun, Nausch flees the scene, thinking he protected his family. It's only days later, Caitlin says, they both realize he may have just destroyed one. What was his reaction when he realized that it was Tammy? Nauseating remorse. Like, he, he could not understand how it happened. How did it go from, I was terrified, and these are some punk kids looking for me, to the life of a mother. He saves his biggest surprise for last, telling police Myers is not only one of his neighbors, he knows her, has eaten dinner at her table. So you know the family? I know the whole family, man. Is there anything you want me to tell the family? Like, my intentions are to take someone who was gonna harm my family up. <laughs> not my only mom, not Tammy. The stunning relationship is confirmed for the first time when Bob Myers later addresses the press. We knew how bad he was, but we didn't know he was this bad. Myers claiming his wife had mentored the troubled youth. My wife spent countless hours at that park consoling this boy. She was really good to him. She fed him, she gave him money. She told him to pull his pants up. Some saw it as odd that you didn't disclose that you knew him to the media at one point and then later on you did. Because I didn't know. I never knew uh, now his last name. I knew him as Eric. I didn't know until I saw his picture on television. Detectives leave their suspect alone in that room, this time to call his mother and let her know he won't be coming home. Mom, I love you. I love you. Okay, I've already told them everything. The only reason I confessed, Mom, was because they knew everything. But the case is far from closed. Nausch won't give up the driver of the silver sedan and claims no knowledge of any prior road rage incident. The uh, so-called confession has some problems with it. And was there a darker side to the relationship between Tammy and her killer? Mrs. Myers used to come to the park and like try to purchase things off of him. Stay with us. Ten days after the shooting of Tammy Myers, a wide-eyed Eric Nausch is ushered into a courtroom for the first time, an image that brings his friend turned informant Caitlin Christian to tears. What do you see when you see this shot in court? Just terrified. I mean, he looks the picture of a confused kid right here, don't you think? Yeah. In court, Nausch is with his new defense team. Conrad and Augustus Klaus. They're known around town for their assertive advertising and now for an assertive defense. We are conducting our own investigations and uh, some of those already appear to be bearing fruit. The Klauses want that interrogation tape tossed out. And I just cocked it back and I started shooting them. Saying their client had smoked pot right before surrendering to police and was impaired while making those statements. The fact that our client was high and the police knew it um, compromises the result. But they're not just betting on a technicality. They claim the killing of Tammy Myers was justified. The facts seem to point to uh, self-defense in this situation. I think there's a possibility at least that he was feeling like his life was in immediate danger. Now I think in a court of law uh, it's going to be very hard to prove that you know firing 20 some odd rounds is self-defense. Do you think Eric should go to prison as a murderer? No. But I don't think Eric needs to go away forever. 
because, she says, for months, Eric was facing a barrage of anonymous death threats from what he suspected were rival drug dealers. The situation serious enough for him to get that 45 caliber pistol. What kind of threats? Um, he said they would come through text messages, phone calls, Facebook messages. He didn't know who they were, but that they were going to skin him, skin his baby sister alive, uh, take care of his mom as well. You saw the actual text messages? Absolutely. And as now says repeatedly in his interrogation video, he thought they'd come for him the night of February 12th. In his mind, it's they threatened me. This was them coming at me. This was me protecting myself. And she believes now she's claimed that he saw someone pointing a gun at him from Tammy's car, prompting him to begin shooting. But there's no doubt in your mind that he felt that somebody waved a gun at him, that he saw that. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that he felt absolutely threatened, that it was me or it was them. But Brandon Myers insists he never revealed his gun. Did you wave your gun? No, not at all. Given the Myers family's previous omissions, Jackie Heinrich has trouble believing them. Her suspicions turbocharged by rumors among people who knew Nausch, like Anthony Lee, and what they claim was the true nature of the relationship between Tammy and Nausch, mentor and mentee, or something more sinister. Mrs. Myers used to come to the park and like try to purchase things off of him. Find out that it has more to do with drugs than mentorship. Heinrich points out that investigators found the painkiller oxycodone in Tammy's purse. We don't know if that is related to their relationship or if that's separate, if that's totally on the up and up. Nausch never mentioned anything of the sort in his interrogation, but the accusations lead to headlines like this, suggesting the shootout wasn't about aggressive driving at all, but about dirty drug dealing. The one thing that we can positively say at this point is that this case was not about road rage. But according to Bob Myers, it was all just the defense trying to muddy the waters, one of many off-the-wall theories his family has had to knock down. It, it's just one thing after the other. It's like my daughter was pregnant by him and they were in a relationship, or my wife was in a relationship with him, or it was a drug deal gone bad. Did anybody in your family ever buy drugs from him? Definitely not. Some question the fact that your wife had oxycodone in her purse. Yeah. She had a prescription for it. She had a prescription for three years for it. How do you plead to count one? Murder with use of a deadly weapon. Not guilty. On March 12th, Nausch pleads not guilty to murder charges as police are closing in on another piece of the puzzle. Who was driving the car when Tammy Myers was shot? Nausch won't say, but cell phone records lead police to his 27-year-old buddy, Derek Andrews, owner of a silver Audi, which sure looks a lot like the car in the security video. Andrews and Nausch are soon seated side by side once more, not in the Audi, but in a courtroom with matching jumpsuits. This was an act of unprovoked use of force on behalf of Mr. Nausch, with Mr. Andrews being the driver and complicit in this act. Andrews denies any involvement, pleading not guilty. Could he be that mysterious man seen here in the sketch, the first alleged road rage incident that started it all? Up next, we put the pieces together. Shows Brandon, what was that? And that's when Brandon got out of the car, Mrs. Myers got out of the car. But the truth is stranger than fiction. It turns out everybody's wrong. Don't go away. With arrests made, suspects in custody, and charges brought, finally, the prosecution story, the version jurors will hear at trial. DA Stephen Wolfson thinks he can finally explain what happened the night Tammy Myers was killed. There's no evidence to support that Mrs. Myers was doing anything other than being out with her daughter, giving her daughter some sort of driving lessons. Wolfson believes Crystal Myers, Yet what happened next is a series of bizarre, tragic coincidences, the odds of which, even by Vegas standards, are incalculable. 10.10 10 p.m. Tammy's offering that driving lesson to her daughter in the school parking lot. By coincidence, Eric Nausch is in a park across the street. He's carrying a 45 caliber handgun and the weight of the world on his shoulders after death threats from some rivals. Now this is a, a kid, in my opinion, uh, who had a 45 caliber weapon that speaks volumes. A 45 caliber is a huge weapon. 
Now she notices the Meyer's vehicle and its slow moving maneuvers and apparently misconstrues that as a threat. He thinks the driver is stalking him. And nobody seems to dispute that it all started right here in this junior high school parking lot. Just out for some driving lessons. 10.50 p.m. After the driving lesson, Tammy Myers gets back behind the wheel and begins heading home. 10.56, she sees a silver sedan speed up behind her and pass aggressively. Her impulsive teen daughter makes a fateful decision. Crystal reaches over and slams on the horn. If that horn hadn't been honked, none of this probably would have happened. It's full-on road rage as the silver car pulls in front of the Myers. Crystal says the driver hops out, walks toward her mom's car, and says, I'm going to kill you and come back for your daughter. We'd be very interested to find out who was in that other car, because we don't believe it was Mr. Nausch. Back at the park, Nausch is being picked up by friend Derek Andrews, coincidentally driving a different silver sedan. Meantime, Tammy Myers makes it back home and instead of dialing 911, drops off her daughter and picks up 22-year-old son Brandon, who grabs his pistol. He happens to be a registered handgun owner. It was a, a mistake on her part, in my opinion, but it is what it is. The search begins as mom and son take off looking for the road rager. Moments later, they locate him, or so they think. They pulled up, put him there right here in front of us. She saw the silver car right here. It was literally right here in front of us. What does she say when you see the car? Brandon, that's them. Those are the ones that threatened to kill me and your sister. A chance encounter and what would be a fatal case of mistaken identity, as Tammy has the right color but the wrong car, one occupied by Nausch and Andrews. It's right here that she thinks she's found the car. And it's at that same moment that Nausch thinks he's being followed by this green car. So now you have both of them mistakenly paranoid about the other. When Nausch spots the stalking green Buick, the same exact one he spotted in the parking lot, he surmises that he's the one about to be attacked. Moments later, shots fired. The first, but not the last time, bullets will fly that night. At that point, the evidence says that Mr. Nausch uh, raised his weapon in a threatening manner. This is a loud 45 caliber gun, makes a lot of noise, very intimidating. She goes, Brandon, what was that? I said, Mom, we're getting shot at. At that point, she's shaking. He says he fired some shots there, but he didn't hit anybody. This should have been the end of it, which is now she's now gotten to threaten the drug dealers who he thinks are behind him. He's fired his weapon. They've learned their lesson. Both cars speed off. Myers and Nausch each heading home, taking parallel streets. But remember, they live only a block apart, and in the final, cruelest twist of fate, find themselves headed for disaster as they turn toward their houses, winding up on the same street. The Myers pull into the cul-de-sac. Derek Andrews follows them in. And that's when Brandon got out of the car, Mrs. Myers got out of the car, there's no evidence to suggest that Brandon or Mrs. Myers did anything to legally provoke and give Mr. Nausch the legal right to use deadly force. The minute he follows them into that cul-de-sac, he's now become a threat. What did you think was about to happen at that point? Did you think there was going to be a shootout? No, until they started shooting. And everything was like, like slow motion, like very slow pace. It was, it was weird. Nausch empties his 45 and reloads. The evidence will show Mr. Nausch, uh, in an unprovoked way, for stupid reasons, uh, chose to drive down in a neighborhood that he was familiar with. And he saw two people and opened fire. When the shooting stops, the sedan backs away, and Brandon Meyer sees his mother on the ground. She was laying and bleeding. So just seconds more and you would have both made it into the house. Yeah. A year later, that house soon to be only a memory. The Myers family packing up, moving out of the neighborhood and away from the specter of Tammy. I catch myself all the time calling her. I'll sit in my chair out in the living room and I'll go, hey, babe. Nothing comes back. 
The quiet cul-de-sac, once a safe and secure street for the boys' football fun, will now be remembered for the woman it could not protect. Well, I hate looking at this. I just stared at the ground right there. But I know that she was right there. The family has had a book written telling their side of the story as they await the trial of Eric Nausch. Bob will wait until after that to lay his wife's ashes to rest. You haven't buried your wife? Oh, no. Why not? Because everything that was said about my wife, when I put my wife in the ground, I want all the truth out. And I think the only way we're going to get that out is from a trial. Mrs. Myers, as I understand it, was a nice lady who was willing to try and help a troubled kid. That's what the evidence will show and nothing more. Hanging on the door over here and driving around like a clown. A year later, another incident in Las Vegas between the driver of this truck and a motorcyclist. But Brandon Myers didn't need to see that to give peace a chance. In the wake of his mother's death, he surrenders the 9 millimeter pistol he took with him that fateful night. The cops have it. I mean, I, don't, I told them I don't want it back. They can keep it. For Crystal, the youngest Myers child, life has been difficult. The loss, the scorn, the guilt. You saw everything. Yeah. I asked myself, what if we didn't go? Or what if I didn't want to go? Or what if I never honked the horn? It probably would have been different. Crystal is coping the best way she knows how through music. You say that you've actually written a song. Yeah, I did. Do you mind singing a little bit? Sure. The angel fly and let the song go. I know she'll be all right. All these people judging us everywhere we go. The pain will never leave. It will always remain the same. In the end, the Myers family did not see the trial they had been waiting for. In March 2016, Eric Nausch changed his plea to guilty for second-degree murder. He faces a possible maximum sentence of life in prison. Derek Andrews also changed his plea to guilty of voluntary manslaughter and accessory to murder. He faces a maximum of 15 years in prison. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.